please welcome to the stage Bloomberg Hong Kong Bureau Chief Fion Lee. I hope you can see me here. Welcome, everyone. <laughs> Let me fix one thing so that you can see me. This is the only thing that I blame my parents. Uh, <laughs> so I'm thrilled to have you in our office today. Um, it's a very special time to have you with us. Uh, you may have noticed a big 25 sign on your way out to this auditorium. Uh, this year marks the 25th anniversary of our Hong Kong office. Uh, for Bloomberg, so uh, it's, it's a pleasure to have you. An event like this really um, get us together, um, all these amazing minds, remind us why we are here, is to really to contribute to the community, to keep our readers, clients, and people informed. Um, as a journalist, I'm particularly excited about the topic today, disruption, because that pretty sum up what we cover on a daily basis. Uh, we are seeing it in every single field, um, from business, politics, society, to technology, and, and the environment. The challenge is really not about making sense of it. I'm sure you all know what disruption is. Um, the key is really how to be the winner in disruption, or how we can disrupt to win. Where are the opportunities for innovation, for enterprise? How about the opportunities to, opportunities to make money? I'm sure that's what we care a lot about. And probably through disruption, how can we find stability? So to help us navigate our way through um, all these questions, the disruptive forces, today we have some really great experts with us in the room. We are honored to have Mr. John Jung um, right in front of uh, the crowd. He was a civil servant for 30 years, um, served as the financial secretary for almost 10 years when he was in the government. Um, he was among the most popular of, uh, senior official in Hong Kong, if not the most popular. And then welcome you back. We interviewed you when you were running for the chief executive last year. So um, I will be in conversation with John in a few minutes. After that, we'll hear from a panel of experts who will talk about consumer trends, habits, business, technology, and urban farming. Um, we want you to be part of our conversation today. So throughout the sessions, we will be polling you so you will have a chance to have your voice heard. Please follow the instructions on the screen. Um, my colleague might put it up later on. Um, anyway, we'll see it later on. So you can punch in your answers on the screen. Um, but first, let me kick us off. Um, I, I have to invite Marcus Shoma, Global, Chief Global Economist of Pinebridge, to our stage to give us his view. And with that, I want to say a big thank you to Pinebridge for making this happening today. Thank you so much and welcome. Does that work? Perfect, yes. Uh, thank you for the nice introduction. Uh, delighted to be here in Hong Kong and share with you uh, very briefly some of the key macro themes we think will shape financial markets in 2019. Um, and let me say it's also nice to be in Hong Kong during the sort of late autumn and enjoy the more moderate temperatures here, especially at the time when back home in New York City, where I'm based, we, we today have five inches of snow. That's quite depressing, so I'm glad I'm here today. Um, um, if you look into 2019, uh, at, uh, in November uh, of 2018, it's always interesting at this point of uh, the calendar, something big seems to happen in the world. When I was here uh, last year, at about the same time, everybody was just talking about Bitcoin. That's the only question I, I got. Nobody was interested in my unemployment forecast or inflation. It was all about Bitcoin. But markets were doing really well and everybody was happy in those days. Uh, 12 months on, everybody's nervous and uh, worried about uh, what needs to happen for markets to rebound and will there be a recession? So as the economist for Pinebridge, I've uh, traveled this year um, with a very different kind of story. I'm not looking so much anymore to fine tune my forecast and tell you precisely what the US growth rate will be next year or tell you exactly 
whether China will be growing at 6.4 or 6.3%, I don't think that adds uh, value anymore uh, in the environment that we're in. I see myself more as a risk manager now and trying to evaluate, can the business cycle that we've seen so far be extended by another three, four years? Or are we indeed looking at a severe downturn and maybe even a recession in some parts of the world? Because if we are at an inflection point like that, I think we need to make more drastic changes to our investment strategy. But if we are not at this inflection point, then you could actually lose money if you turn bearish too early in this business cycle. I was in Switzerland last year and I spoke to a client there who was uh, asking me uh, when the great correction would come because he was sitting on cash. He had sold all his assets and was sitting in cash. And in Switzerland, you have to pay 75 basis points when you're sitting in cash. So uh, if you do that too early, you can actually do great damage to your portfolios. Um, so as a, as, the, as the risk manager, I'm, I'm looking at a world where we have a lot more uncertainty, which is obviously impacting market volatility. But it's also impacting me as a forecaster because the confidence intervals around forecasts are much wider now than they were five, ten years ago. You can look at a chart of uncertainty like the one I have on my slide here and you can see how uncertainty has increased uh, after the great financial market crisis and then and jumped up another level after the election of uh, Donald Trump. We're also living in a world uh, of more debt. I think that's another uh, element of this business cycle to keep in the back of your mind. Debt levels have increased enormously in the developed world, but also in the emerging markets, which makes it much more dangerous now for central banks to raise interest rates. We don't need as many rate hikes anymore this time to slow down growth compared to previous business cycles. And that little introduction takes me then to um, the challenges to extend the business cycle. The first challenge we see is for the Federal Reserve in the United States not to raise interest rates too high. In fact, I think it's the biggest challenge. Almost all recessions in the US are caused by the Federal Reserve. It's always interest rates going too much, too, going up too much, and uh, debt levels are being at a, level, at, at, a, uh, at a level where the increase in financing cost eventually prevents uh, people to refinance. You start to see defaults, unemployment starts rising. That's typically how recessions evolve. Now in the US we have right now a very good fundamental backdrop. We have low unemployment, we have still very moderate levels of inflation, but the Federal Reserve has started to increase interest rates um, in order to remove the stimulus that was introduced after the great financial market crisis. Now the first few rate hikes never really impact financial markets or impact economic growth. But we've gotten to the level now where interest rates are very close to neutral. The Federal Reserve has an, uh, a model that estimates where the neutral rate is. And if you're looking right now at the level of interest rates and the level of inflation, we will get to neutral in December in the US. So every rate increase in 2019 will be much more growth restraining than any of the rate increases we've seen in the last three years. And with every rate hike next year, the recession risk increases. So one of our calls is for this business cycle to be extended. We can only see one or two rate hikes in 2019. We cannot see the five rate increases the Fed itself is forecasting. So we need to see a change in the committee. We need to see a change in the communication from the Fed over the next couple of months that will give us some hint and some confidence that a pause or a suspension of the rate hike cycle is coming by the summer. If we do get that, I think the business cycle can be extended and um, we would be wrong to advise clients to significantly alter their portfolio strategies. If the Federal Reserve keeps raising interest rates into uh, the second half and the end of next year, the recession risk will increase and I'm probably going to be back here in November and talk to you how bad the recession will be. The second challenge, and I'm going a little faster through my slides, the second challenge is China. Um, 
in the US, we're looking for the central bank to engineer a soft landing. In China, it's more almost the opposite. China is already landing and lending quite hard right now. The economy is slowing quite severely. And the question is, can the government cushion the slowdown and maybe even engineer a rebound in the economy? So um, we're tracking very intensely the stimulus tools the government is using, whether that's tax cuts for consumers, whether it's a depreciation in the RMB, or classical stimulus tools like monetary policy, um, whether that's uh, the uh, reserve rate requirements, or whether it's the even more classic credit supply measures, in this case, uh, total social financing as a share of GDP. So far, the, ev the evidence that the stimulus is happening is, I think, I would say is actually there. We're seeing the government trying to use those tools. What we haven't seen is that the stimulus is actually stimulating economic growth. That will be the second major challenge um, to extend this business cycle. So let me uh, some fast forward very quickly to the end and sum up my comments. So we're looking at a world where growth is slowing, but I'm not talking so much about those forecasts, uh, whether it's 3.8% next year, 3.6% uh, in 2019, because there's, an, there's an, an odd sense of consensus among most economic forecasters, whether you look at the IMF, for example, if you uh, look at the uh, consensus on Bloomberg, that I'm also a part of, um, if you look at the Federal Reserve itself, if you look at their forecasts, everybody's essentially forecasting that growth will gradually slow from here and go back to some more longer term average. So the growth spurt we had in 2017 was very short lived and we're going back to some kind of a longer term average. Everybody has this forecast, but I think nobody has conviction in those forecasts. And that's what's so interesting right now. So that's why it's it's dangerous to rely on some of those forecasters and ignore the uncertainty and the conviction intervals around them, which is the reason at Pinebridge we decided to switch out of the forecasting mode into risk management mode. And the main message that I want to leave you with today is to look out at these two challenges that I described, the Federal Reserve and any evidence we're getting from the committee and the central bank itself that the minds of the people are changing and that we may not be getting as many rate hikes as the Fed's communicating so far. And look at China and any evidence, like purchasing managers indices, that the stimulus, which is, which is uh, running right now, is actually helping to soft land the Chinese economy and maybe even re-stimulate. If that all happens, then we most likely have a year of two halves. First year, first half of the year will still be uh, dominated by rate increases in the U.S. But the second half of the year, we could see a pause in the U.S., a weakening of the U.S. dollar, and a rebound in China, and market sentiment could change quite significantly. Lots of obstacles to get there. I laid out my two challenges. But if we get through those two challenges, the business cycle can be extended, and I think the markets could rebound after uh, a very bad 2018 and potentially another tricky first half of 2019. That's the main story we have right now at Pinebridge. I hope that was somewhat instructive, and I hand it back to Fiona.